We are live? Yes. Yes. Good morning, everyone, and, uh, and welcome to, uh, to the uh, Argo Light and Axiomatics webinar. We'll just wait a few more minutes uh, just to make sure that uh, everyone is here. If you have any uh, issues, uh, let us know in the chat, but everything should go smoothly. Uh, okay, perfect. Nice. Thank you. So if you have any questions uh, during the talk, uh, you can write them down in the chat uh, window and we will uh, we will answer them at the end. Uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So, uh, yes. Let's maybe wait one more minute. Perfect. It's good, Sylvain. You won't uh, you won't struggle too much with the uh, French accent. Okay, let's uh, let's start. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first episode of this uh, webinar series uh dedicated to uh to quality control and titled let's perform more qc in less time uh so uh let me first introduce uh, neshe temeltas uh who's a sales application engineer at axmaltics she will be uh, doing the demo and uh and me vincent renaud also a sales application engineer at axmaltics uh, and i'll be doing the presentation uh so this uh let's slide this uh, this webinar uh, or this uh, webinar series is dedicated to uh, show how we can improve quality control process for fluorescence-based microscopes and doing so while saving time and energy. Uh, we have two webinars, the first one today, uh, which is uh, titled Get to Know Your Microscope uh, and uh, basically ded dedicated to show uh, how to perform quick quality control and assess performances of, uh, of one microscope. The second webinar on Thursday, uh, so in two days, same time, uh, is about making the QC workflow easier and faster and is much more dedicated to uh, microscopy facility. We would have several microscopes to monitor and uh, want to do that uh, in uh, the least time possible, uh, but with the most reliable data uh as possible and and uh and monitor that over time so for today i'll start with a very brief introduction of axiom optics and argolite uh and then we'll discuss quality control uh so why uh, should we do quality control what can we do uh and how to do it and then i'm going to give the hand to neshe who is going to run you through a demo of uh an argolite slide and show you how you can use this tool to assess the performances of your microscope. And at the end, we'll have the question and uh, the Q&A session, uh, question and answers. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can go in the, ch in the chat, uh, write them down, and uh, we will answer them at uh, during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, yes. 
So let's start with a very brief introduction of Axiom Optics. Axiom Optics is a distributor uh, of optical, uh, of scientific optical system. Uh, we do several things. One of them is uh, microscopy. We, uh, we are specializing in microscopy, in light microscopy actually. And we are a team of three uh, for this uh, business unit. Philippe Clemenceau, who is the founder of Axiom Optics, and Nisha and myself, uh, were both uh, both sales application engineer uh, based on the East Coast for Nishche and on the West Coast for myself, and we're covering the the whole U.S. territory. Uh, and Axiom Optics is the the U.S. distributor of Argolite. Um, so for the microscopy uh, business unit, we have we offer several add-ons. Um, this is the list of uh, what we currently do. So we have uh, the the Riscan Confocal Microscope add-on, uh, which is a system that will transform a wide field uh, microscope into a uh, laser scanning confocal system with super resolution capability. Uh, we also offer the um, Mikao uh, add-on, which is uh, 3D adaptive optics uh, add-on, uh, increasing the, the, the resolution and, and localization accuracy of uh, single molecule localization microscopy techniques and single particle tracking. Uh, we also offer the camera-based system from Lambert instrument to do uh sorry camera based flim system uh from lambert's instrument to do a uh, flim and frets uh it's compatible with any camera based technique so white field of course but being disc turf uh, light sheets and then uh also we recently started working with impedex who offers the uh, sensor cell optical tweezer platform uh which is a platform for optical tweezing but also uh force measurement uh dedicated to mechanobiology Beside the uh, microscopy system, we also offer cameras and, uh, and the Argolite uh, solutions. Uh, for cameras, we have a very wide variety, uh, very wide range of cameras from, I would say, very uh, camera for uh, very regular uh, applications. Uh, the CMOS uh, camera from Texen, uh, using the new, uh, new sensor from Sony, it's, uh, they are very, uh, cost effective cameras with very good performances, very low noise. Uh, um, so very good for any typical uh, regular fluorescence applications. For more high end applications, uh, we have the uh, SCMOS cameras from Amatsu. Uh, and then as we move to the right of the slide, we are going uh, toward faster uh, cameras for uh, applications requiring more speed. So the lightning and the high cam flow are cameras for applications that requires extra speed and extra sensitivity, uh, like uh, like the scape light sheet or or um, uh, voltage indicators imaging or things like that. Uh, and then the Argolite that we're going to discuss today. Now let's uh, introduce Argolite. Uh, Argolite is a is a French company. Uh, which actually I'm I'm going to specify beside I mean despite my uh, my accent I'm not uh, I'm working for Axiomatics and not for Argolite but yes Argolite is a French company they are located in the southwest of France in Bordeaux it's a rather young company um, it got created eight years ago uh, it's a very international company uh, most of their sales is uh, is abroad and their vision their goal is to remain the best uh, solution and to offer the best solution for quality assessment and quality control for fluorescence-based microscopes. Um, okay, so uh, enough of, uh, of presentation of uh, both of our company. Let's, let's start with a subject uh, of interest, which is quality control. And uh, I would say with the first question, which is why we should do quality control. So it's, I mean, the answer is can be, uh, can take a very long time, but I, I guess if we want to summarize it, uh, I, I think that for microscopy cores, uh, as it was stated in this paper uh, published in 2016, one of the main tasks of an imaging facility is to monitor and maintain the optical performance of the microscope systems hosted by the facility. And, and so quality control makes a lot of sense because you can, uh, the, the point of a microscopy facility is to offer a very high-end systems, uh, but also once you get them to maintain them at their best of their capability. So this is uh, this is why quality control um, is a uh, is a uh, kind of mandatory. But uh, so now that we know why we should do quality control, let's discuss what we should do. And and let's start with this uh, with this um, uh, scheme. It's a wide field microscope, so a rather simple system. And as we can see, there are several elements that can go. Uh, 
that could go wrong, basically. So let's start with a, with a light source excitation. So uh, here it's a lamp, could be LED, could be laser. Um, then there are a lot of optical elements in the microscopes. Uh, of course, there are the objectives. Um, there are motorized, motorized stages and detectors, cameras or point detectors like PMT or high detectors. And all those elements, they can, uh, I mean, they vary specially, obviously, in X, Y, and, uh, and in Z. Uh, they also uh, vary spectrally, so depending on the wavelengths. And, and they can also vary over time. And all of those elements uh, will uh, give the, uh, what we call the microscope response. And this microscope response uh, obviously also depends on, uh, on, the, on the X, Y, Z, on, on the lambda, the wavelength, and then uh, on the time. So this is just to show that uh, it's obvious that we should perform quality control, but it's also uh, kind of obvious that it's more complicated uh, than it appears at first sight. And this is just for a wide field microscope. If we if we take a more complex system, like a confocal system, um, you see that there are many more uh, components, many more optics, many more moving parts that can introduce errors, uh, that can uh, be a source of aberrations, of misalignments, of uh, damaging and uh, or aging. And uh, I think in, it kind of makes sense that the more components there are, the more programs can appear. So it's not, it's, it's, I think this shows that it's not, uh, it's not as straightforward as it sounds to perform quality control on a microscope because there are so many things to test and, and we, it's easy to get lost in that. So that's why um, I, I think this uh, paper came out about four years ago, uh, which, uh, which was the best practice manual from the German Bioimaging uh, Society. And uh, they are proposing a list of tests that can be done to perform quality control on the microscope. Uh, so we see here, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my, my mouse, but it's uh, basically I start with uh, uh, checking the objective, uh, first visual inspecting the lens surface and doing PSF measurements, then checking the illumination, stability over time, field illumination homogeneity, uh, the power of the uh, illumination, then checking the chromatic aberrations, the pinhole, scanner, the Z-drive detectors, etc. And if we, uh, if we add all the time that it requires, we end up, uh, based, on, based on, on this paper, we end up with a total time of almost five hours. And that's for one microscope, and uh, it's actually even just for one objective. Uh, so despite that it sounds like it's mandatory to do uh, quality control, it also looks like it's uh, on a realistic point of view. It's also very complex. Uh, I guess you, you understand very well uh, most probably because of the manpower and because of the time it requires uh, five hours to check on the on microscope. It's not something that you can do obviously every every week or every other week. So uh, before going further, uh, I would like to 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 discuss actually uh, the why not the why quality control is not something that is done on such a regular basis or as much as we would like to uh, or as much as we are aware it's, it's required to do. And uh, the first question, the first answer obviously is because it's very, I mean, super time consuming uh, as we just saw it. Uh, I think there are also other answers, uh, most probably because it requires several tools, several protocols. Um, uh, protocols could depend on the software you use for uh, to run your microscope, etc. Uh, also because the tools you used usually don't last long. If you, uh, if you need to, uh, um, to make a sample of bead to uh, measure the PSF of the microscope, uh, it's a safe bet that you're going to need to make a new sample of beads uh, after a few weeks. And, and also maybe because quality control is not fun. I think we all agree here that it's much nicer to uh, image a very nice sample than to look at some, uh, some beads. Um, so long story short, quality control is basically laborious. And um, yes, so I think this is, this is definitely uh, what Argolite is trying to answer and 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 trying to uh, to change. Um, so this is the time for a very quick uh, uh, marketing talk. But basically, the the objective, the goal of Argolite is really to make not just the hardware but the complete workflow uh, of quality control uh, much faster and and all in one tool. Uh, going from ana analyzing the performances to managing that over time and to being able to share it with 
um, with uh, other members of the Microsoft facility or users or even uh, microscope, microscope vendors if you want to request some help or stuff like that. So the point is really to streamline the workflow of quality control. Um, so for the next uh, three, five minutes, I'm going to present uh, the Argolite technology from the hardware to the software, and then we're gonna go through the demo. The core technology of Argolite, or the, the, at the very beginning, the core technology of Argolite uh, was the special glass uh, where they could uh, locally change the internal structure of the glass by using uh, a laser-induced uh, process. And, and so locally, the glass becomes fluorescent. And it's, it's, it's locally both in X, Y, but also in Z. And, and therefore, they can create 2D and 3D patterns. And uh, these patterns are uh, fluorescent uh, over the pretty much the whole spectrum. Uh, so excitation from 300 to 650 nanometers and emission up to 800 nanometers, though it's much brighter uh, for UV and, and blue light than for red one. Um, but it's not all. Also, they can control the uh, the intensity of the fluorescence, and they they can uh, make sure that this point will be twice as bright as this point. And actually, some patterns comes with a with a calibration uh, uh, protocol that has been tested uh, before being delivered to ensure, for instance, the linearity uh, fluorescent emissions. Uh, the sorry, the linearity of the fluorescence emission of uh, some pattern. So then when you measure that, you're sure that if it's not linear, it's due to the microscope and not to the pattern itself. And it's also uh, super stable. So I used to say that you couldn't, uh, you, uh, you couldn't make it bleach, uh, but when you say that, usually people, they, they want to prove you wrong. So they were applying 100% of the power on the, on the pattern and, and trying to make it bleach. And, and actually uh, they were coming uh, after us and saying, you see, it's, uh, it's not as intense as it used to be, so it, it can bleach. And actually, no, it doesn't bleach, it's quenching. So yes, we can observe an intensity decrease, but long story short, if you uh, put it in the dark uh, for some time, it will recover uh, up to 100% of, of, of the nominal intensity. Um, so it's something that will last basically forever, or like for, I would say, enough time. Um, so that's for the hardware. Now for the software, Nishi is going to uh, run you through a, a complete demo, but this is, uh, this is the, uh, where you end up uh, for after doing any analysis on any pattern. The workflow is basically you acquire an image, you upload it in uh, the software, in uh, Argolite software called Daybook software. Uh, you select your image and the test you want to perform accordingly and you run the test and this is what you will get on the left you will always have your pattern the fluorescent pattern so here we're looking at gradually spaced lines in the center uh we have some graphs uh that uh that uh, explain you uh that explains how everything was acquired uh what we are looking at extra and then on the right side we have the we have some relevant parameters uh some some uh, more secondary uh, parameters and then on the bottom right uh, it's always the same. We have some documentation that explains how everything was calculated. Uh, and then you can export the metrics if you want to, uh, to use your own uh, data managing software. Uh, you can also generate a, a report in one click that you can share. Um, and yes, so it's pretty much always the same workflow and, and you will be able to see that over the demo. So this is all the tests that we can uh, currently assess uh, using, using the, uh, I mean, on, on, on the book software. So field uniformity, uh, which is a uh, intensity homogeneity over the field of view, field distortion, lateral co-registration accuracy, which is a very complicated word for uh, lateral chromatic aberrations, uh, line spread function, which is pretty much like a point spread function, but in one direction, uh, lateral resolution, um, stages behavior, uh, whether it's drift uh, over a Z-stack or over time or uh, repositioning accuracy, going to one point and coming back to the same point. Are we really coming back to the same point? Uh, and to which extent? Uh, can also measure the intensity response of the system, the spectral response. And then using the power meter, we can also measure the power and uh, get back to the, area, to the irradiance of the, uh, of the system. So 
irradiance is a power density. Uh, just want to mention that all those tests, I mean, we're not limited to those tests. There are many more tests we can do. We can uh, assess the uh, actual resolution, for instance, or the uh, depth of field, or the uh, actual chromatic aberrations, and many more things. But all those tests are the ones that are automized in the book analysis software. So basically, for all those tests, you just acquire one or several images, you upload them, you run, and you'll get your, your information. For other, other tests, uh, uh, you can get the information, but it's not as automized. Now, uh, the third step uh, after acquiring an image and analyzing it is to uh, uh, monitor the performances of the microscope over time and to get an idea of the uh, an idea of the, uh, of the the different behavior of the microscopes uh, and of a single microscope, but also of several microscopes. So it's something that we will emphasize much more uh, during the second webinar in two days on Thursday. So uh, we won't go, we won't spend too much time on that. So if you're curious about that, and, and I think it will be super interesting for microscopic core facilities, please uh, join us uh, on Thursday. And this is just to show you what, uh, what a report looks like. Uh, everything here is automized in one click. Uh, you get the pretty much the same thing that we got in the, uh, in the debug analysis software, but just in a, under a PDF with a uh, with, um, pattern, uh, the graphs, uh, some relevant parameters, extra. So if we come back to, uh, if, if you remember uh, why we're not doing quality control, or why, why most of people are not doing quality control, not enough, um, I think we are answering most of those, uh, those uh, worries. First, Argolite uh, solutions can save you a lot of time. You can do in one hour for several microscopes, just 15 or 20 minutes as you would be able to see during the demo what you used to do in half a day or even one day um so it's it's of course less done i mean less less uh, more use for your users because you're not uh using the microscope to do quality control so they can use it to uh to uh, to test but it's also much it's also more use and less downtime in the way that you can get an overview of the performance of the performances over time and uh uh and then prevent any failure and uh, any more downtime. Um, it's also an all-in-one solution because with one slide you get the fluorescent patterns and the power meter and you don't need to, uh, there is no preparation required, you don't need to write any scripts, uh, everything is accessible within a few clicks. And also Argolite lasts pretty much forever, there's a lifetime warranty for the presence of the fluorescent patterns and there could be new calibration done for uh, intensity and or for the power meter uh, on demand. So overall, I believe it's the best ratio of time of use over data collected uh, that we can find on the, on the market. Now let's go uh, to the demo. Uh, and, and right before giving the hand to Neshe, I want to present the setup for today. Uh, we will be using our Leica DMI8 white field microscope. We have a motorized Z stage. We're using the inbuilt AP fluorescence uh, source, which is a which is a lamp, not LED. Uh, then we're using the Amamatsu Orca Fusion SMOS camera. Uh, we will start with a 20x objective just to show you the overview of the patterns, and then we will switch to a 100x uh, oil immersion objective, which is uh, I think much more fun to uh, to uh, to test. Um, and then we'll do everything through Micromanager software. Uh, this gives me the opportunity to mention that uh, the book software can run, uh, can, can use pretty much any kind of uh, image format, uh, whether it's uh, acquired through Micromanager and it's a TIFF or through uh, NIS Elements or Zen or LAX software or yes, Velocity or pretty much any kind of uh, images. Uh, and this is the slide we're gonna use, an Argo power slide, uh, which uh, offer both the fluorescent patterns and the power meter. And for the fluorescent patterns, you have the map on the, on the left side of this slide here. Um, so everything you see here is uh, what we have on the slide. Uh, so Neshe is going to give you a tour, a tour. And, and yes, I hope you will, uh, will enjoy the demo, yes. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. 
So as Vincent mentioned, I'm going to give you a tour of the slide. And here we start with the, um, I'm currently using a 20x objective. We start with the um, uh, target pattern. This pattern is the brightest one, it's easiest to find. So usually when you start your quality control, it's easier to uh, locate the patterns just by focusing on this one. I'll go to the, oh, sorry, Let me go live. There we go. And here we have the matrix of rings. With this pattern, uh, I'm going to be performing intensity inhomoge inhomogeneity, field distortion, and chromatic shift tests. And I will go down on the slide. We have 3D patterns in here. Um, using these stairs, uh, you can perform the test for um, X, Y accuracy during um, Z stack. And here, I'll focus a little bit. We have the resolution patterns. So we have four different patterns. Uh, these are the gradually spaced lines, uh, starting especially like the for the uh, Argo HM, uh, HM uh, glass. Um, they start from 700 uh, and goes down to 100 nanometers with 50 increments. And we have the horizontal, vertical, and plus minus um, uh, plus minus 45 degree uh, resolution patterns. And then uh, I will conclude with the intensity response, which is like, uh, which is the, these patterns are the um, French equivalent of NIST. So uh, we can ensure the linearity and we will be measuring the linearity, like the um, intensity response, and we should obtain a linear line um, when we do the analysis on these patterns. So now I will switch to, oops, sorry. I will switch to a 100x objective and start imaging the matrix of rings. Okay, let's focus a little bit. And I will do auto ounce. And I will take an image and save it as metrics of rings. And then I will go and launch the book the analysis. So when I launch the analysis, it asks me to choose which uh, slide that I will be using. So I'm using the Argo Power. And when you're using the Argo Power device, it requires you to upload the calibration file, which you can download it from Argo Lite's website. And I already did that. So I'm launching the analysis. And I'm going to be uploading the files. My wet desktop. So, so first of all, I'm going to be doing the field distortion uh, tests. Um, I selected my image and I go to the analysis and I select the analysis uh, that I want to perform. And this is a very user friendly uh, software. It also uh, shows you which pattern is required for you to um, run this test. And I'm, uh, we're using a Hamamatsu uh, camera. So the, um, the pixel size is uh, 6.5 microns and I'm using a 100X objective. Usually uh, the software takes it uh, from the metadata, but uh, for some reason it's not taking it. And I'm going to go and start run. Wait a couple seconds. OK, 
So uh, what this software does is we have this perfect grid and we basically uh, superimpose the perfect grid on the raw image and we calculate the shift between the uh, where the like the center uh, centroid of the ring versus the perfect grid. And in here, after calculating that, we put them on a normalized field distortion heat map, which we're seeing in here. And arrows uh, basically uh, point the direction of the distortion. And uh, here we have the bar uh, for calculating how much the distortion, how much shift there is. And this is very important for um, quantitative microscopy because sometimes like um, you need to know like the where the things are, the relative position um, is important. And uh, this can be corrected uh, on the uh, on using the image J software. And here we're having uh, we see. Let me show you the parameters. I think it's a little. Um, okay. I think my computer my screen is a little big. Uh, sorry, export metrics. Yes, let, let me uh, comment very quickly, uh, Nisha. So the, the screen we're using here is a 32 inches screen. So if you're using a, like a laptop, 13 or 16 inches, it, because it's scaling back to, uh, to the size of your screen, it might be hard to read for me. It's basically impossible to read things here. Uh, yes, it's just because we're using a big screen. Okay. Um, so I can just go ahead and tell you about like the um, the parameters. So right now we're seeing here is uh, the maximum distortion um, rate along X is uh, measured as um, this is the this is giving in terms of um, percentages and it's 0. 0.6 and uh, the maximum distortion rate along along Y is a 0.49. So, uh, and we also see the normalized entropy, which is 96.25%. Um, uh, so I'm gonna go back to analysis and I'm gonna be using the exact same uh, pattern for my field uniformity. Wait a couple seconds. And in here, um, so we see a normalized field uniformity heat map. As we, we would expect, uh, it, is, it is centered. We would expect it to be like centered and uh, less intense in the corners of the field of view. So here we observe three different, uh, three different uh, diagonals, three different lines. The green line, which is this one, is measured from like the highest uh, intensity point to the lowest intensity point. And here we have the two diagonals, uh, basically diagonal profiles, uh, which which is like a, a left to right and right to left. Uh, they're all like plotted in here. And we have the centering right now, we have the centering accuracy of 81.89%. And we have a, a for the for the purple line, which is uh, which is this one uh, from uh, left to right. We have a roll off of seventeen point uh, uh, zero five, and for the pink one, which is this one, we have um, a roll off uh, diagonal profile of like nineteen percent. So usually um, we expect around like thirty percent uh, for a wide field microscope. And I will now go back to uh, my micromanager. And what I would do here is right now I'm going to be looking at the chromatic shifts and I'm going to take two images, one uh, with DAPI and the other one will be with GFP. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. This one. And I'm going to change the illumination. 
So right now we're in the GFP channel and I'm going to increase the exposure time. Let's snap. Okay. And now I'm going back to my daybook analysis. I'm going to be uploading both of the files. Okay. Here we go. So this is a uh, chromatic shifts are measured with the test called lateral co-registration accuracy. So we have to, we have to select two images. And I'm selecting this one as a reference and the, this one as the image to compare. Again, entering my um, lateral pixel size. I'm starting the analysis. Looks good. And let's run the test. Couple seconds. So um, what the software is doing is basically it uh, takes the two images and um, basically it gives us a multi-channel image and it calculates the uh, XY uh, position of the each centroid of the, uh, of the uh, each ring centroid and basically calculates the shift in between when it's superimposed. So here we see a, um, we see a, chroma uh, we see a shift towards the uh, towards left in here. And here we have the parameters, which is uh, we have the Pearson correlation coefficient, um, which is uh, 0.82, and the normalized orientation entropy, which is the 69.92%. Uh, um, and also this gives us the maximum vector magnitude in pixels and uh, micro microns. We can go ahead and um, we can go ahead and um, just generate a report. Okay, we're having some issues for the PDF report. Um, we can just export the metrics. And um, so in here, as we can see, like we, we have all the parameters to correct, uh, correct for like the chromatic shifts. And this can also be uh, corrected out, like corrected for after like post-processing. So now um, we can go ahead and I'll be switching back to DAPI. Because the patterns are the brightest in DAPI. And exposure time while, to. While you are finding the next pattern, Nisha will just uh, uh, comment a bit. Okay. Um, Sorry. While, while you're moving, and I said while you're oh, um, uh, finding the next pattern, I will I will comment a bit. Sure. Um, I'll so, be I'll be moving to the resolution pattern. Now. So. so uh, we we Nishi mentioned the the uh, the parameters uh, some parameters that we could that we could get when we uh, run the chromatic aberration test or the field distortion test and uh, those parameters uh, helps you actually to correct uh, when doing post processing so to correct for the field uh, distortion or to correct for the chromatic aberrations and this is very useful if you want to do I mean most of the time it's a little bit of chromatic aberration is not a big issue or a little bit of field distortion is also not a big issue. But if you do quant quantitative microscopy and that the position, the relative position of, of things really matters or uh, that the co-localization of, of, uh, of things also really matters, then you want to get that as accurate as possible. And you can do uh, post-processing. And in the documentation, uh, there is the procedure to correct that on image or Fiji. So it's, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, done automatically, but it's also maybe not something that is uh, mandatory every time, every single time. So, but if you need it, you can do it very easily. 
Okay, so right now I'm uh, I'm on the um, horizontal, um, horizontal uh, resolution pattern, and I'm going to be doing a uh, Z stack in here. Let's wait a couple seconds for it to complete. Okay. Go. And now going back to Daybook. We have the files uploading. And I will also show you. Uh, another um, another property of the software. So here I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be choosing the lateral resolution test. And in here we have a best focus selection uh, option. So basically, uh, if we if we put like a Z stack, then the software can determine the best focus uh, for the res uh, for the uh, image that we're uh, choosing the process and. This is a good uh, thing to do for um, for the resolution, especially like making sure that we're focusing on the uh, on the plane and getting the most of the resolution. Okay. okay. Let's start the analysis. I'm going to be cropping the image. And I will run the test. OK, so um, here we are seeing uh, basically what the software is doing is plotting the um, so pl plotting the intent, uh, plotting the profile, the line profile. And what we should see is basically like four peaks and the this one minimum. The, the minimum basically where what we're seeing here is the distance uh, in between the lines. And I. Basic uh, and I mentioned before that uh, for this pattern, the distance between the lines, distance for the, uh, the distance between the first and the second peak and the third and the fourth peak doesn't change. It is stable. The, what changes is the distance between the second and the third peak. So um, in here, we're measuring the uh, we're measuring the intensity, and then. Um, this is basically starting from like the 700 nanometers and goes uh, goes to 100 nanometers with 50 increments. And in here, as we can see, uh, at some point we cannot resolve it, resolve it anymore. Like this seems like a big peak. Like the 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 second and the third one looks like just one peak. And in here, what we're reading is um, let me change the contrast criteria. Here we go. We have um, we have a lateral resolution measured as like uh, 339 uh, nanometers. So we are a little bit off because this is a wide field system, and what we expect uh, theoretically will be around like 260 nanometers. So we observe that like in here we are a little bit off, and this is how uh, the software basically computes the resolution in here. And. I would go back to my pattern here, and now we will move to the um, intensity response pattern. In this case, we will be using this. So I'm going to take a snap and intensity response. Going back to analysis. Okay. And this time I'll be choosing the intensity response test in here. And I will start the analysis.
So here it gives me the response um, for the for the measured and what's expected. In here, the the line, the black line that you're seeing, is what we would expect, and the uh, and the green line is what is measured. So usually this looks uh, this looks very linear because we're using a SCMOS camera, and they're typically uh, they typically have a linear response, but this test is actually very important for uh, uh, for the people who are using PMTs and HYDs, as uh, they can get like less linear as they age. So um, and also this is very important, like for like the quantitative microscopy, who are like um, who are at where like the intensity ratio is important. So um, here, if I go into the um, go into our, my primary metrics. I can see like the uh, intensity maximum, intensity minimum, and the measurement uncertainty, and also like the pattern dynamic range. Another good thing is like I can save this um, as a reference response in here. Save as a reference. Okay. And then uh, basically, when I when I do a new measurement and compare it, this will be giving me a, uh, and this will be giving me how much shift there is, like after some time when I'm doing the quality control. So right now we're not seeing anything because um, we had a, ref a reference response overlapping the response to be compared because we're using the same uh, response. So this is also a very useful tool for like measuring if there are any uh, intensity uh, response changes like over time. So I have uh, finished the analysis part. Now I will go ahead and show you. So the power meter of po power meter part of the, the slide. So basically, Argo Power uh, has an additional has an additional um, power meter on top of the glass, which is located here, which is located here, and we he here we have the uh, HM glass, and um, and we will be using the map behind. So because we're using an inverted microscope, we will be using the map behind to uh, find the to basically locate the um, locate the power meter. So the power meter is compatible with air objectives only. Uh, that's the other thing to mention. And let's run a power measurement. And we're using the uh, um, excitation of three fifty and the one power measurement. Um, let me uh, increase the sampling period. Okay. So as we can see here, um, we're having we're measuring the power as um, around one uh, seven one seventy uh, microwatts, and you can do the real time measurements um, on your microscope. And if we set it to zero, so. And stop. Basically, what we need to do in here is the we need to enter the excitation wavelength, and um, just click on the run power measurements, um, and it will the software will run the power measurements uh, for you. If I may, if I may comment a bit more, uh, you can uh, also enter the um, numerical aperture or the field number of the objective as well as the magnification. And that will also give you, uh, that will automatically calculate the power irradiance in the sample plane. So that's useful, for instance, if you know that uh, such a sample will start bleaching out at, uh, after, I don't know, uh, uh, 
X uh, after a 10 microwatt or something like that. Uh, so that's something that is very useful. And you can also measure the uh, excitation uh, response as a function of the power instruction, which means if you use a laser and you put 1% of laser power, uh, and then if you if you apply 4% of laser power, do you really get four times the laser power or or is it not linear? This is the kind of information you can get on the bottom side of this uh, of this window. Okay, so um, this is basically the end of my um, demo and I can just uh, answer the questions now. Let me go back to the... Okay. Uh, Vincent, we can't hear you if you're talking. Yes, sorry. I, I just said I want. Uh, I would like to come back quickly to the end of the presentation. Um, so let's start back here. Uh, just a quick overview of the uh, the offer of Argo Light. Uh, there are several slides, and basically. Uh, let, if we if we consider the Argo HM, Argo SIM, and Argo LM, the main difference is the size of the patterns. Uh, the Argo LM will be matching better low magnification objectives because the lower the magnification, uh, the lower the magnification, the bigger the field of view, and therefore you need uh, bigger patterns. Uh, Argo HM, Argo HM obviously is for uh, higher mag objectives, and the Argo SIM is for even higher mag. Uh, objective, I would say more for deconvolution based systems uh, like SIEM or, or Ariscan or things like that, especially when you want to measure uh, the resolution. Uh, there is also the Argo well plate, which is uh, a well plate format uh, designed more for uh, HTS uh, and HEA uh, system. Um, and then the Argo power, which is the one we demo today, which is exactly like the Argo HM in terms of fluorescent patterns, but also integrate, integrate um, a power meter. Uh, and the Argo HM or Argo Power are definitely the most modular since they go from basically 20x up to 100x uh, objective lenses. Yes, so that's all. And uh, so we are ready for the question and answers if you have any questions. Uh, but if not, we are, we are having the second webinar on Thursday, same time. Uh, and this webinar will focus much more on uh, monitoring the performance of the microscope over time. We'll do some case study, um, how to troubleshoot and things like that. And we'll present the latest feature of Debug 3, which are making the, the uh, QC workflow even uh, easier and faster. So let's look at the questions. Um, Will it be possible to measure and calculate the PSF with this slide? So it's a, it's a very good question. The, the smallest feature we can create is actually not a diffraction limited point. It's actually more like a, more like a donut in 2D. And uh, so this donut, the inner diameter is about uh, 300 nanometers and the outer diameter is about 700 nanometers. So this is not diffraction limited when you use high NA objectives, obviously. If you use lower NA uh, objective, it's a different story, but let's talk about high NA objective. It's not diffraction limited. So you won't get uh, a proper PSF. So this, actually you might be wondering how we can measure the resolution. Um, it's actually by, so this is a good point. If you move that in one direction, you're creating two lines. And these two lines, you cannot, you cannot change the spacing between the, the, the two lines, between, the, uh, between those two lines. But what you can control is the spacing between two lines and two other lines. And for the gradually spaced lines, that's why Neshi mentioned four peaks. We are actually having, for each, each measurement, we are having four lines. And what is changing is the spacing between the two central lines. At some point, you can't resolve it anymore. That's the limit of resolution of your system. To come back to the point spread function, um, no, we can't because of that exact same thing. Uh, but this is why we can measure the line spread function, though. We can measure uh, the the equivalent of the point spread function over one direction, which will be basically um, over this direction, this will be uh, diffraction limited, and over this direction, this will also be diffraction limited. That's a line spread function over X and Y, not like not a proper point spread function. Um, 
Next question, why, uh, why does HM slide have such large positioning errors of 410 nanometers for patterns? In this case, lateral resolution spacing of 400 is unreliable. Uh, I'm not sure what you mentioned for the 110 nanometers positioning errors. It's so a uh, few things about the, the way they are manufactured. As, as, as I just explained it for measuring the resolution, uh, and, and yes, you're right about that, Alexander, what matters is the spacing between two, um, two set of, of, of lines, and therefore the positioning of, uh, of basically the laser creating the patterns is of importance. Uh, practically speaking, I think the, the positioning accuracy that we uh, mentioned, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, practically speaking, it's more about 30 nanometers, but uh, theoretically, it's a bit bigger. Correct, yes. But this does not uh, matter that much for measuring the resolution, because if you know the pixel size, you can actually measure the theoretical, uh, sorry, the, 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 the real spacing between those two lines, uh, because you know the 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 pixel size of your system so you we basically uh we're, we're not um depending that much on on uh on this uh, positioning error uh that said there is also uncertainties because any metrology solution come with uncertainties you cannot talk about measuring something without mentioning uncertainties and the uncertainty is about uh i think the the pixel size divided by two uh, so depending on your pixel size, you will get a more or less accurate measurement. Uh, we can send uh, additional information about that. Um, so question from uh, from Louis Kerr. You say the patterns are fluorescent. Do you provide a curve of intensity across the spectrum? Yes, we do provide that, uh, both for excitation and emission. Um, basically, excitation, uh, the peak is at about 300 or 350 nanometers, and then uh, the excitation gets um, lower and lower. Um, and the emission is also a broad emission and starting about 15 nanometers after excitation is also a broad emission, but we, everything is in the user manual. Uh, are they luminescent at all? That's, uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Uh, I know you can measure the lifetime with it, even though I've, uh, never done it. Uh, I know they have a specific lifetime. I think it's a dual exponential, uh, but about luminescence, I don't know. Uh, we'll check and come back to you. How do you assess uh, Z resolution? So we have 3D patterns. We didn't show them during this webinar, but they are a set of 3D patterns for each slide. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's not the measurement of the Z resolution is not automated yet because to be able to do so, we need to have access to more parameters uh, like the, the motorized Z stage and things like that. And it's making everything a bit more complex. Uh, but basically you have, uh, you have patterns which are defined in Z. Uh, they are called the crossing stairs. So it's basically two sets of. Uh, so this is Z, okay? And they go, they go, um, they go like that. And uh, by by measuring uh, what you can see and what you can't see, uh, and by knowing the distance between uh, each different uh, uh, each different uh, uh, single pattern. Uh, you can assess the resolution and the depth of field, and also the chromatic shift, actually. But it's it's more like a manual measurement. It's not automated in the book software. And uh, I can send you documentation about how to do that, actually. Is there any any other questions? I think we have answered to all of them. Let me check, but. So what about the 3D sphere? Um, the 3D sphere is, uh, so it's called the meridians of the sphere because it's it's not a complete sphere. It's basically uh, three circles, one like that, one like that, and one in the center. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we can show you, uh, let, me, let me try to upload a video that, that shows it. Um, it's basically, uh, yeah, so it's a 3D pattern. Uh, the uh, the size in Z uh, depends on the slide for the algo HM, it's 50 micron. 
for the argosine, it's 25 micron, the diameter, I mean. And um, you can uh, you can use it to measure also to assess, uh, for instance, uh, actual chromatic shift. Uh, though it's not, it's important to keep in mind that it's not a direct measurement of the chromatic shift because typically, uh, something I didn't mention, but the patterns are embedded at 170 micron uh, below the slide. Uh, so this imitates the thickness of a cover slip uh, number 1.5. Um, but typically when you image something, you have the cover glass and then after you have your sample. And so actually after uh, 170, after the thickness of the cover slip, it's, uh, you, you're into your sample, which is water based or, or uh, different things, depending on if you use other media or extra, but it's, not, it's typically not glass anymore. And uh, so the, the chromatic shift you will be measuring here will be going by going through glass all the time after the 170 microns. So it's uh, you need to apply a ratio of uh, the um, optical index of the glass divided by the optical index of your sample if you want to measure exactly uh, the chromatic shift that you would get uh, on, on your sample. I'm trying to upload the video, but it might take a while. No, I don't think I can do that actually. I'll send you, uh, I can, I can, we can share uh, some documentation about that after. Any more questions? Okay, so it's been one hour. So if, if we don't have any more questions, I, sh I think we will um, end, the webinar, end the webinar here. Uh, but again, please, uh, we are happy to, uh, to, uh, to have you for a second webinar in two days. It, we will do a very quick summary of what we did today, uh, but we, it will be very brief, and then we'll spend much more time focusing on uh, the workflow uh, for a microscopic core to manage all these informations. Um, as we could see today, we can get a lot of information, but none of them are also uh, the most important ones to monitor. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, today was focusing on how to get uh, the most of data, and on Thursday will be how to manage the most important data. And these webinars will be recorded, so um, you can watch them uh, later. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, shoot us an email. And thank you, thank you very much for joining. Have a nice day. Yes, thanks so much. And have a good day, yes, bye. Bye. <laughs>